Hello everybody. As always, welcome back to my channel for another lecture on the esoteric keys to disclosure. I'm going to spend this lecture actually answering your questions that I have gathered from the comment section. So let's begin. Okay, so this question is from Manifesting Marin, and you said, has she covered RH negative blood types yet? And so I actually had a small piece on the RH negative factor for a prior lecture, but I went on for too long and I wasn't able to include it. And I have realized that in order to understand blood and the RH factor and early humanity, um, I'm going to have to do a longer, like I'm going to have to do a few lectures on it to really make sure that all questions are covered. So I will be doing that, but I can say that um, I do not agree with the very common notion in alien God ideology that the holy aspect of human blood or the human aspect of human blood is from aliens. Um, there's a weird notion in that belief system that human beings are really the apes and that the only reason why there is any angelic or exalted nature or human level um, that is beyond the animal kingdom is because obviously these alien beings came and gave us theirs. And so that again is another example of a very complex and nourishing and enriching conversation about the development of the human blood system and actually the waters in the human body and how that has developed over a long period of time, epoch to epoch, essentially through periods of transformation or transfiguration or um, uh, basically the same way all organs are created. Our blood system has changed over long periods of time. Um, and so the story of our blood is actually very beautiful. Um, it has changed from the Lemurian epoch to the Atlantean epoch to the present epoch. Um, just like our whole body has, and there's a story to it. And so this whole thing about just cloaking it with like the genetic modification cult basically created human beings and anything with RH and anyone with RH negative blood is basically an Anunnaki and anyone with like RH positive blood has like monkey in them and stuff like there's a lot of conversations that literally are trying to talk about the spiritual nature of blood. But again, it, it keeps going back to this weird alien God thing where it's all about like genetic modification and rather than there be a spiritual process there that's actually transformed the body and changed the blood system from a spiritual level downward, um, evolved us. It's like a, it's it like happened in a lab basically. So this is the kind of goofy stuff that we're all falling prey to. And I will go into it, but I'm going to have to spend longer on it than kind of the 10 or 15 minutes I initially had planned. I realized when I started to write it, I was like, oh my gosh, we really have to go way back with this. We have to talk about the water systems in the body from the very beginning We've got to work our way up and we've just got to cover the whole topic of blood um, in this series if we really want to understand it because that's what it requires. And if we're going to talk about the creation of the human form or the materialization of the form and the materialization of the different organs in the body, the water systems, which is like the limbic system, the blood system, Every, all of that has a spiritual purpose. And obviously the Eastern traditions really understood this because in Ayurveda, in Chinese medicine, they talk about the spiritual nature of these different parts of our body and the elemental nature of these different parts of our body, which has to do with their creation. So um, it's a much bigger conversation than I can, add, than, than I can answer in five minutes. 
Um, but I do have that on my schedule to lecture on. So I have not forgotten. I just don't want to leave you guys with more questions <laughs> than answers. You know, um, I want to try to do my best to really cover it fully in detail, you know. All right, next question. This is from Jenny6359. And you said, Gigi, I heard somewhere that members of the hierarchy are required at some time to incarnate into physical form as part of their evolutionary process. This seems to echo that information. Would that be the law of sacrifice? I also have an inner feeling if one soul does this, which is rare for some, physical incarnation, they are able to share the results of the experience with others in the spiritual realm so they don't have to do the same. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You're 100% you're on the right track here. Um, so the earth is thus far the most material sphere in our solar system. And it's sort of like a consolidation sphere. And the reason why I call, call the solar system a school is because that directly relates to the death and rebirth process, right? So when, you, when a person passes away, they essentially go through these different levels of the cosmos. And the different levels of the cosmos are, ac are actually associated with different planetary spheres, okay? Um, and so ultimately we're sort of always, our soul is always kind of passing and working with the different planetary energies. And also the earth is working with these different planetary energies. And how the earth evolves is that other beings that are on, I, I guess you could say a higher evolutionary plane relative to the earth at that time have to essentially offer something of themselves. And that be, then becomes a substrate for human development forward. Okay, and this happened with the human form. And it also happened with giving humanity the organ of mind. And so in that way, the earth and humanity is in direct image of the spiritual hierarchies because these beings from the spiritual hierarchies sacrifice something of their own essence, their own soul essence to um, essentially give human beings the template and the substrate to continue moving on. And what I mean, and, and I'll just get into this uh, uh, briefly here. Um, if you want to actually enter the if you want to go from a higher plane, right, or a higher dimension, right, into the lower planes, that requires a sacrifice. If you want to go from the lower planes, third dimension, into a higher plane, that requires sacrifice. So everything requires sacrifice or uh, a transubstantiation or a transfiguration or transformation or transmutation. I said this in my last lecture that there is a false paradigm going around that you can just like go into some kind of technology and like create a wormhole and go anywhere in the cosmos, meaning you can go in any dimension of reality, like a higher dimension. You can just go there with a machine, right? Um, and this is completely false right? The only way that a person can make it into a higher plane is through sacrifice. They have to sacrifice something of themselves to essentially eventually dematerialize out of materiality into a higher plane. And this is also called a spiritual master or a higher adept. But you have to be essentially transfigured, and this means you have to let go of your trauma, your pain, um, and you have to let God and let Christ into your heart. And your body will essentially be uh, 
transformed or etherized into a spiritual body over time. And that's the mystery of resurrection in, in, the, in the Western mysteries. Um, and so there's a very real process of being able to at will go from one plane to another. And at no point can a machine do that for you. Um, you have to be able to do it with your consciousness. And that is through spiritual realization. And spiritual realization transforms your form from a physical form to a spiritual form. It's also sometimes called the resurrection body. And we, we, we evolve in direct accordance with the sun as well. So we have to actually sacrifice something of ourselves in order to rise out of materiality. We have to sacrifice our negative ego. We have to sacrifice our addictions to the material plane. We have to sacrifice selfishness. And we have to kind of live in an exalted nature to essentially be released from materiality. That's pretty much what every you know religion talks about is how to do that. Um, but then also, if you want to go from a higher plane into a lower plane, that also takes sacrifice. And so for higher beings to enter into the spiritual plane, there was a sacrifice that occurred within the angels to create that pathway. Once that sacrifice happened with some leading angels, um, usually associated with the Venusian sphere or the sun, once that path was made, a stream could flow from other spheres, right? But it took a sacrifice in order to actually even move downward into this earthly sphere as it was forming. Okay, so any kind of shift in, in dimension, any kind of shift in spiritual plane requires sacrifice. Now, this is also why when you see something like the dark arts and these, you know, black magic practitioners, why they're like killing animals and trying to kill people and stuff, it's because sacrifice can also be used for evil. And they can be trying to use actual physical sacrifices in order to access the abyss, in order to access the hell realms, in order to access the lower planes. So that's the law. And it is also used for evil. It is also used in the dark arts as well. Okay. That's why sacrifices happen in the dark arts. Okay. But there's a higher way which is also known as resurrection. It's known in the Steiner teachings as the etherization of the blood and the etherization of the form. You'll also find that teaching in the um, development of the booty spirit, the consciousness soul. Okay, the intuitive soul. There's a whole process in anthroposophy where it's explained, the etherization process and the rising out of matter is explained by different kinds of levels of integration, right? And those are also associated with different planetary spheres, but they're the, essentially the mind, the whole being is of a different quality. It's like a whole initiatory process out of matter. From the higher planes of the solar system, there's also an initiatory process to enter matter from a higher plane, okay? And this is what is known as the kind of sacrifice of the angels. They had to sacrifice to just get into physical reality. They had to sacrifice their entire essence. And when that happened, it sort of poured upon and around the earth, allowing a kind of um, mental sheath, the mental plane to exist around the earth. So it was their, this these solar beings, it was the very substrate of their soul essence that began to enter and surround the earth and every human being when they entered it through a certain kind of sacrificial rite. And then through the Venusians as well, through, through, through the angels that came through the Venusian plane as well, there's a sacrificial rite where the very substance of their essence is used to create a different organ on the human etheric template, okay? So it's actually their soul essence. It's actually their very essence. Um, and so 
we see the law of sacrifice everywhere in, in spiritual development and a lot of different teachers have actually written specifically about the law of sacrifice. Um, but it, it exists in a smaller internal way where we have to sacrifice in our life, you know, to make achievements, but also it, it has a, a, a macro meaning where great beings also sacrifice something of themselves to give to humanity. It's, it's a core principle of creation. Sacrifice to create a new substrate is a core part of creation and evolution. Okay. And um, there are, it's really interesting in some Eastern traditions and also in the secret doctrine, Madame Blavatsky does talk about that there were beings that were called the Las, and this is L-H-A-S. And the laws are different than the angels from Venus. They were active before Venus came about. The spiritual plane of Venus came about in the way that we understand it. And according to theosophy and the Eastern mysteries, there were some beings that were called the laws that were supposed to have incarnated but they didn't want to. So there's some kind of ancient mystery in the solar system when the earth was receiving all of its forces during its involution, um, where there were some beings that, that were supposed to incarnate, but were avoiding incarnation. And their avoidance of incarnation actually made it so their life was more difficult in the future. So that's really interesting and kind of crazy to think about, but that's a different thing than the Venusian story. Um, the angels from Venus come around in a big way around the end of the Lemurian Epoch. And remember that the Lemurian Epoch and the Atlantean Epoch, the earth is much more open to cosmic beings. After the Atlantean Epoch, the earth is pretty much like in a quarantine. You could, it's a very simple term but the earth is really not accessible. It's got a bunch of membranes around it that prevent beings from other spheres from coming here. So for me, the materialist idea of the cosmos where you can just like a human being can just get in a spaceship and just fly infinitely towards other planets. That's not really how I personally see it. I feel like there's actually these membranes that exist um, that you can't really get through, whether it be radiation or, or, or magnetic um, storms. That's what it looks like clairvoyantly. But there's absolutely these areas that are like barriers. And they're physical barriers because they're just masses of energy that you can't get through. But they're there for a spiritual reason, because that's actually kind of like a gate to another system in another plane. So the Earth is not just like a material that the cosmos is not just like a material like the material plane that can just go on forever there are barriers that's how i personally see it um and so in before that so in the atlantean epoch and the lemurian epoch it was not like that the human being did not have their individuality as much and it was more open to beings from other spheres coming in um which are really beings from the angelic hierarchy that are identified with other spheres. That's how we understand them. And so in earlier epochs, there actually were beings from other spheres that were coming here um, because we were just sort of, especially in the Lemurian epoch, we were still very much in an involution, getting patterned with um, our mission, really. So that's actually a very key principle is, is that I feel like a lot of us operate from a paradigm as though it, it's Lemuria or it's Atlantis. Our soul remembers when the gods walked amongst us, this, our soul remembers advanced technology. Our soul remembers this kind of more magical cosmic existence that existed in Atlantis and Mu. And then um, we keep projecting that as though it's possible in this epoch, which this epoch is characteristically very different than those epochs. 
And this epoch is, is about inner development. And so we don't have all of that access that we did in earlier epochs. Okay. So ultimately, um, when the angels from Venus made their sacrifice, they didn't have to do that. There was enough development on the Venusian sphere that if a soul wanted to, they could just continue to evolve on that sphere. But if one of these angels from Venus were to sacrifice themselves, they would accelerate their growth and they would do a loving act on behalf of God. So nobody had to, none of the angels from Venus had to. The angelic beings from Venus chose to, and that was very different than earlier periods of development on the planet when the earlier pat patternings seemed to be completely karmic beings had to, it was part of the overall evolution. But when we get to like the development of the human eye, meaning the capital I, the letter I, not I, but the capital I in anthroposophy, as soon as humanity begins to really develop that and get that, that also is free will. And so that's also mirrored in our contact. And so the angelic beings from Venus had somewhat of, de somewhat of an eye developed, somewhat of a self-awareness developed, um, but it was not nearly developed on the Venusian plane as it was to be developed on this plane. And so truly the angels that sacrificed themselves to come to the planet um, to ensoul here, um, it was a great act. And that's why it is so important to speak out and to say, let's not cut that lineage off. There's a reason why in the Bible, Christ is associated with the morning star. He's talking about um, a lineage of Christ, a lineage of, of the Christ essence that goes back to the planetary sphere of Venus, right? And so this is why um, we have to very deeply understand that all evolutions of the form happen through sacrifice and through really a process of transmutation, like the human form evolves because of sacrifice, either your personal sacrifice, life after life, or in a larger sense, even the sacrifice of higher beings, right? So um, that is that. And it is true that the Venusian sphere is the higher aspect of the earth. A lot of the, a lot of the mystery teachings considered Venus to be one of the biggest mysteries in the occult. And a lot of the teachings about Venus were held back and they weren't taught because of the potential for these teachings to be corrupted. Um, and then as soon as Blavatsky and Theosophy brought it forward because they did exist in the Eastern mysteries, not even necessarily in like the public Eastern mysteries, but uh, Tibet and India had an incredible record of secret books and secret stuff that wasn't even in the public there. And so when they did get brought forward, pretty much within a hundred years, people were talking about being showing up in spaceships and Venusian space brothers. And it was literalized immediately because if you really read what theosophists were writing, they were talking about spiritual beings from other spheres. When you read what Rudolf Steiner was saying, he was talking about spiritual beings from Vulcan, spiritual beings from these different spheres that were directly related to the earth, right? The same thing with Manly P. Hall and all these other esotericists from, you know, the mid 19th century to 1930. You know, these, they didn't even have a literalist sense at that point. Like it was automatically known that if you were talking about a being from another sphere, that it was an angelic being from the solar system school in another plane. Like that was already accepted. People understood the teachings of the angelic hierarchies very well. It was a foundational 
you had to have it. You know, mystery schools, um, it is a foundational knowledge. You have to understand the spiritual hierarchies. You have to understand the epochs of the earth, the evolutions of the earth. You have to have that foundation. You can't do anything without certain teachings being your foundation, which is why spiritual teachers, like pretty much every single one from that period, would talk about cosmogenesis, anthropogenesis, the spheres, all of that. It was something that just had to, you had to understand it was foundational. But now we're trying to enter into these topics with no foundation. And so it's becoming weird. You know, it's like we're creating it in our weird image, our materialist science image, our obsession with genetic engineering, our obsession with technology. We're like projecting our own consciousness onto these spiritual things because we have not taken the time to actually learn the occult science of the planet and the human being. So we're just entering into these topics and just projecting our own culture onto them. When in reality, this goes back billions of years to before the planet was even physical. That's really where it begins. So how can materialist science even begin to understand that without spiritualizing? So because Venus is really the higher aspect of the earth, it's considered the higher plane of the earth. Um, uh, whatever is developed and, and is new goes to Venus. And it also goes into Vulcan. And it also goes into the higher spheres on the chain. It also goes to the creation of the planet Jupiter. So, but we'll just start with Earth and Venus because Vulcan and Jupiter are in a sense still being created. So whatever life and beauty and harmony is created on Earth goes and nourishes Venus. And then Venus in turn nourishes the Earth. And there is a cyclical nature to that. Um, and the higher planes will always favor what is new. And something can only be truly new if it is in the image of God, if it's in the image of Christ. So nothing is really new unless it has been created in the image of God and in the image of Christ. So the higher planes thus will always favor um, goodness and love and anything that is technically new will flow up from the earth. And so there is a natural exchange and that was also known by the angels of Venus um, that enriching the earth is enriching Venus. It's enriching and creating Balkan and that to um, transform pain and anger and fear on this plane, on the earth plane, is to nourish and inspire the higher ones because we're all sort of in this system together. Okay, next question. This one is from Jose Ruza 3304. And you ask, would evolved spiritual abilities be for the quality of experience in the material universe, or are they not necessary in the afterlife? I wonder what the angels think of nuts and bolts, black magic tech, considering it has given tangible results to humanity through misleading acquisition? Good question. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the development of spiritual abilities or psychic abilities is directly linked to, um, I, I guess you could say, spiritual maturity or spiritual advancement. So in Anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner talks about the different phases of evolution of the soul. So consciousness soul, the booty spirit, the Buddha soul. And so this, the soul actually evolves in different phases. And every phase 
has a different set of capacities and every phase is more integrated than the last, more psychic than the last, right? More dematerialized and more spiritualized than the last, right? At least for where we are now. And different organs are essentially developed in the form. And so psychic abilities like clairvoyance, clairaudience, um, uh, being able to sense things, empathy, those really come about due to um, spiritual work. You can lose them if you decide to go into a downward spiral. You can devolve for sure. Um, but ultimately, they are associated with the overall growth of the individual. So in other words, you have to evolve in your epoch with time properly. So you have to use the solar Christ force to evolve your form, to create and evolve your organs, your etheric template. You have to evolve with the sun and with the cosmos at large, with time. The cosmos is evolving. The angelic hierarchies are evolving. Probably the, the abyss is devolving and you're evolving. And so we have to evolve over time. And part of that evolution is that our form um, can get little differences in our organs. So our overall template is done. That was finished in the Atlantean epoch. But now we're kind of spiritualizing out of matter and we're getting slightly different shifts to our form. So ultimately, if we don't develop in this epoch properly, then we cannot potentially incarnate into the next one with this life wave. There's going to be some kind of reconciliation that will happen if someone doesn't spiritually develop with the life wave. It doesn't always have to be the worst case scenario of like reamalgamation or something like that. It can be um, incarnation in a lesser sphere. Um, but ultimately, you do have to develop with time, with your planet and with the sun and with Christ. That's the whole point of moving, of taking a body, of, of living, right? So... Evolved spiritual abilities do um, increase the quality of your life here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but also they allow you to incarnate into higher forms and a certain kind of form in the future as well. So it's like your higher abilities represent that you have certain organs that are awakened which is very meaningful in the spiritual plane because that's going to affect um, your next cycle of incarnation, right? And what do the angels think about nuts and bolts, black magic tech, considering it has given tangible results to humanity through misleading acquisition? Yeah, so... Um, mm, I've been very vocal on the reality that a lot of people are attributing things to technology that are not possible, right? And while technology can certainly help us, right? It can make our lives a lot easier. Um, technology cannot achieve what are spiritual feats. You know, you cannot transcend the material plane into the higher planes with technology, right? You can't achieve resurrection through technology. You can't achieve truly uh, um, forever life by merging with machines because to live forever, as I mentioned in my prior lecture, means that you are in a spiritual body and that you no longer have to be subject to the material plane. That's what living forever means. It means that you have built your resurrection body, what we call in the Christian mysteries, the resurrection body, and you're beyond time, right? And we, we're slowly building that now. Every, every human being is slowly trying to build that body. 
um, and slowly spiritualize out of matter. So um, there is this bizarre movement of very strange people that have come forward, like, you know, you've all know Harari. That's basically like, you know, downloading your soul into the cloud or into some machine is basically ascension. It's basically resurrection. And so every spiritual feat, every spiritual ability that is developed through sacrifice, through transformation, through inner work is now apparently done with a machine. It's the same thing with the alien God myth where, you know, every, every spiritual transformation of the body that's from a spiritual uh, sacrifice or, or, or transubstantiation that's now done with um, in a lab through splicing genetics. I mean, really wacky stuff that just doesn't make any sense. And that completely deletes any kind of spiritual reality at all. And so that's really what we're confronting is this, this group of um, techno scientist priests that feel that they can just replace all spiritual feats, all spiritual reality with machines and technology. And it's just a lie. You know, none of the things that they're even even with things like um, if you get a chip in your brain and you can suddenly like download Chinese in your mind or you can, you know, access something like Wikipedia. You're, that's not a spiritual experience. That's a materialist version of a spiritual experience. And so we're being told that technology can deliver these spiritual experiences when it just can't. All merging with technology does is trap you in the material plane by damaging and altering and messing up the harmony of your form. Okay, that's what this transhumanist level of stuff does. Where, and by transhumanist, I mean trying to achieve something spiritual through, you know, um, merging with machines. I'm not really talking about like if you have a limb replaced that's mechanical, or even if you have something inserted in your mind to help with paralysis or something. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like degenerative conditions or amputees. I'm talking about actually trying to achieve something that's spiritual using technology through transhumanism. That's the true definition of transhumanism. Um, and also through saying that, you know, you're, you're going to create like some kind of portal that's going to lead you to the fifth dimension or the sixth dimension through technology. You can't do it because in order to go into a higher plane, it requires you to have a transformed nature. The plane, like a higher dimension or a higher plane um, is not just matter vibrating at a higher rate. That's not what that is. A higher plane is actually a different quality of energy. And you have to transform yourself to that quality of energy through the Christ nature within you. And that's literally, it's so funny because it's literally what the mysteries have been telling us for thousands of years. But some, some we're trying to bypass that through technology, thinking that we can cheat our way through it. Technology materializes. It goes the other way. It goes down deeper and deeper into the subatomic plane, into the abyss, into the eighth sphere. That's where that stuff goes. But you're not going into higher planes. You're not going into higher realities. You're going into the lower astral plane and subatomic planes, which is the abyss. Okay, that's where that is. And so there is no using technology to go into the fifth dimension or the sixth dimension. You're not going from the material plane on the earth using some kind of machine to go into heaven, okay? You're not going into the Venusian plane or a higher plane of reality because you actually have to transform your being to get into that plane. And that's why there are what looks like membranes around the earth that in order to get through them and pass them, you actually have to be of a, of, a, of a higher level of initiation. Again, in the Eastern traditions, this is like getting off the wheel of Samsara. You have to have, a, you have, to have transformed yourself in the image of that higher plane to get to it. You have to actually be of that nature. Okay, so a machine you know, because a lot of whistleblowers and stuff talk about these machines being basically miraculous. 
There's no need to spiritually develop. There's no need to study the mysteries. There's no need to understand mystery science. We'll just have a machine that can bring you into the fifth dimension and go anywhere in time and, you know, talk to any being, you know, it's just, it's crazy. There are higher beings in higher spheres that can materialize here, but they don't need to use a ship. They don't even use any technology. They literally just appear because they've mastered the material plane. These are called spiritual masters or angels, right? There are beings in the lower planes and even in even people in, in our world that are obsessed with trying to do things with technology because they're possessed by a Martian dark impulse that I call the Mars impulse, where they think that they can achieve everything that classically has to be done through spiritual evolution through machines. They think they can achieve all of it through machines. They, they, they think eternal life is a machine. They think they can like astral travel through machines. Everything is with a machine, but this is not reality. You can't do any of that authentically with a machine. So how do the angels view that? I would assume that they see it as, you know, a product of our environment where we are tasked to turn inward. We're supposed to be turning inward and we're supposed to be using our inner Christ essence to transform ourselves, to spiritualize ourselves out of this plane, out of this, out of the material world. That's what is we're called upon doing. That doesn't involve any kind of contraption or doodad. You know, it just doesn't. It, it's literally inner work. <laughs> That's literally how we evolve now. And so there's this other part of society that cannot turn inward for whatever reason. They do not want to turn inward. They can't make that inward push. They can't go inward. They, they, they don't want to examine themselves. They're power hungry. They're greedy. They're fixated on trying to get that feeling of peace and joy and, 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 and all of that energy that we get from being spiritually realized, they're trying to do that with machines. So they probably see that as being an inversion of what's really necessary, which is to go inward, actually. We've already reached, you know, I mean, by 1920, we already had basically every single technology we would ever need to help us simplify our life, you know, so we're not slaving away doing simple mundane tasks. You know, we, we, we needed a certain level of technology to liberate us from the mundane so that we could begin to have spiritual consideration so that we could know ourselves, so we could, you know, grow and evolve. But technology is not meant to be worship. Technology is not supposed to be, you know, you, you know, you're not supposed to think that like God is coming through the machine. God is within, you know, and so there is this backwards nature that we're going to have to confront, certainly in my lifetime and, and even probably after I'm gone, you know, we're going to have to confront what technology really is and also some of the darker things that can come through technology from the subatomic planes and from the abyss, right? And we need to stop glorifying technology as being the, the benchmark of human evolution because it's not. Spiritual evolution, being loving, being compassionate, being kind, living in harmony with the planet, that is evolution. That is advanced. That, that means you're advanced. Okay. Next question is from Nikki Alexa. You've said before that the human form is currently metamorphosizing again. I believe you specifically mentioned that it has to do with the heart and lungs or how we oxygenate the heart. I'm curious if this metamorphosizing only occurs when an angelic being sacrifices themselves, who is the most recent angelic being to do so? Or have many of us risen high enough that we are able to do this for ourselves? Since the sacrifice of Jesus was for the opening or development of the third eye, right? 
Okay, so lots of different things here. Um, so the overall form with all of its basic systems was solidified in the Atlantean epoch. So before that, there was an involution happening where the human form and the earth was being patterned with um, patterns that it was materializing, right? That's what made in the image of is. We're literally in an involutionary cycle being patterned with the cosmos itself and we're an embodiment of that. And then once we reached what I call peak materiality around the Atlantean epoch, which means we sunk to our deepest position in matter, we began what's called the spiritualization arc, which means that we begin to actually shed matter and spiritualize. Now in anthroposophy, there's an incredibly important, but people don't talk about it enough, lecture series on the etherization of the blood. I've lectured on the Steiner work on that. I will link that below. And that's actually basically being a direct participant in the etherization of our form or the spiritualization of our form through holding Christ in our heart center. It's phenomenal work. There's so much of the Steiner work that just does not get the light of day and, and the extrapolations that it deserves. And, and the etherization component is one of them. Um, and so now, since the incarnation of Christ, Christ essentially brought the spirit of the sun and the solar Christ essence within every single person. So now we have the ability to use that essence, which, which is within the heart. Our heart is that alchemical organ in the center of our being that we actually use as kind of an alchemical furnace to spiritualize ourselves out of matter. So it's the Christ essence within our heart that leads to our spiritualization life after life in the material plane, slowly dematerializing out of this plane with the planet itself, right? Because Christ's sacrifice also had the Christ essence go deep into the center of the earth, liberating the planet as well, okay? So that's what the metamorphosis is. And as we move out of matter, our human form will begin to change. We're going to get some expansion of our organs in certain ways. And certain there will be changes to our body. There will be different organs that emerge and um, our form will eventually change a little bit as we go. That's just normal. Metamorphosis and evolution is law. It's normal, right? Um, materializing and spiritualizing. There's going to be some metamorphosis going on all the time as we change and shift in the image of God. Okay. So um, the lecture you want to watch there is etherization of, of the blood on my channel. And then I'll also link Rudolf Steiner's incredible work on the etherization of the blood. Um, so in other words, after the incarnation of Christ, we have the power to work upon ourselves through the Christ impulse that is now within us. So before the incarnation of Christ, the world was much different, okay? And we really interacted in a way that was more external. But after the incarnation of Christ, we have the ability to work internally, all right? To make a long story short. And we can work upon ourselves to spiritualize, right? So... Um, and also in the Steiner work, there's a really interesting concept that I think will lead us into the right, um, understanding here, which is that in earlier epochs of the earth, the exalted beings came from heaven, right? They were solar beings, solar beings that then came through Venus and they were beings from the angelic hierarchies that were imbuing the earth, enveloping humanity, and eventually ensouling in humanity. But as the earth begins to evolve further, it's the human beings that become the masters. And this is really quintessential for the Jupiter development, but also the later developments of our earth now, is that it's really, now that we all have Christ within our being, if we choose to connect with that Christ essence within our heart and we choose to develop it and, and learn about it and understand it and know it and use it, it's humanity that now becomes the master. And that was the whole point 
And that's why I go into so much depth in this series of really delineating out what life was like in the Atlantean epoch and the Lemurian epoch compared to later epochs of the earth. So in earlier epochs of the earth, we were interacting with beings from other spheres. We were in an involution where you're being patterned with forces from the cosmos, right? Even walking with the gods. But then after Atlantis, it's we have to rise to that level of initiation ourselves. We no longer interact with those beings in that way. The earth is closed off from other spheres, even as we get our eye and we have to work upon ourselves and rise out of it. And so in these later developments, right? In the final epochs of this earth, even going into the Jupiter phase, it's the human beings that become the masters. It's the human beings that lead each other. So in Lemurian Atlantis, what we had was we had angelic beings from the spiritual hierarchy associated with Venus or the sun that would envelop the human being. There were some lesser planetary spheres as well, but it's really the sun and Venus, which were the main ones that had the most distinct connection. Everything else was secondary. And they would surround the human body and they would, they would influence them, but then eventually they incarnate into it. So we have to understand that our contact with beings from other planes changes as the earth evolves and as humanity evolves. We're not looking at the same kind of contact experience. And, we, and once we get our eye, our individuality, our unique soul essence, um, our self-awareness, it's our job to become the angels. It's our job to become the masters. We no longer are depending on spiritual beings to like envelop us and tell us what to do and, and pattern us with what is morally correct and how to evolve and the secrets of the cosmos. That was done in earlier periods. All that was done in the Lemurian and Atlantean epoch, it's done. Now we're, now we're individuals and now we have to rise out of this material plane by becoming the masters ourselves. That's the initiatory cycle that we are in. Um, so um, we are now the impulse of metamorphosis. Okay, what, that's why the incarnation of Christ is so important is that it's kind of like that's the last kind of sacrifice like that. It's really up to us to do it now because it's within us, if that makes sense. Right. And the sacrifice of, um, of Christ is, it's a beautiful mystery. Um, it's a beautiful teaching. It is probably the most important teaching of our time. Um, I think that a lot of people know who Jesus is. Um, most people don't know that there's a difference between Jesus and the Christ, <laughs> There's a different things, um, but most, many people don't understand the esoteric teachings around Jesus and the Christ and also the Christ, the Christ's existence before Jesus. Um, there's so many beautiful mysteries around Christianity that just are not present in dogmatic Orthodox Christianity. They're gone. And so it's really something that is beautiful and empowering to study um, because of what his sacrifice gave humanity. And when we understand Christ's sacrifice, especially Christ saying, I'm the morning star and identifying himself with Venus, he's identifying his soul essence and his, his himself with the angels from Venus that came and with the solar hierarchy that came in even earlier periods. So he's identifying himself as being part of something much greater going back much further in the earth and human development. Okay. 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 This one is from Louise, Louisa. MSE 2336, and you said, the information and explanations are getting better and deeper, loving the series of lectures. 
My question is about the hierarchy, uh, more evolved beings who sacrifice themselves for our evolution. So your question is about the hierarchy and the more evolved beings who sacrifice themselves for our evolution. Did they have their eye or do they have their eye? Do the Venusians have their eye or are they so divine that they don't need it? This has been on my mind for a long time. Okay, so this got six likes. So this was a, this is a great question. I like your line of thought. So the whole solar system is seeking to develop itself to the point where it can get create a material enough planet such as the earth so that there can be the environment that the eye can truly come in and the eye is also like a solar sun it's, it's a cosmic it, it it's a cosmic force if you will and it needs to be pressurized at the same point with the densest earthly force that's how we have to develop our eye and so the whole solar system was developing and developing and developing until eventually it could get to its lowest plane, the material plane, and create a planet that was the, synth the synthesis of all other planets in a lot of, in a lot of ways um, and was possible to create the eye and possible enough to create the eye or the individuality to the point where that individuality could be so strong within that it could be the defining aspect of evolution and drive them into spiritualization. So before that, there were lesser developments of the eye. This is how I personally see it. This is not, to, to my knowledge, Steiner has not directly commented on this or Blavatsky or any anyone any that, that I personally know of, maybe, but I have not read that. My personal understanding is that they had somewhat a develop of, of, of the eye developed on the Venusian plane and even in the Mars sphere, as I've talked about in my Mars line video, there was somewhat of, a, of development of the eye and self-awareness, but it was not to the degree that would be developed on the earth. And this is also why you see certain Venusian streams that were looking to make these sacrifices to, to connect with the earth so they could begin streams of incarnation so that they could develop the eye, so they could take bodies. So the earthly human being is so important to the cosmos because its ability to have the eye, its ability to be so densely catalyzed in matter to be able to have the eye and sustain it and use it. It's very special. And that's actually what allows us to become spiritual masters potentially in the future is this self-awareness, this I that we have. It's a very, and that's why you, you really do want to associate yourself to the earth. You really want to, you really do want to be of the earth. You don't want to associate being with another from another planet or another star system. Why this where you are as a human earthly being is 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 so you should be so proud of yourself to be at the point where you can have an eye, an individuality that you're in that you're in matter and you're functional. It's an incredible achievement, right? And it's so incredible that you do have, you know, these higher beings from the angelic hierarchy that were associated with Venus wanting to stream into the human form and take a and soul into a body. You know, they didn't want to just lord around human beings and ships. They wanted to incarnate into this incredible human form that was the direct embodiment of God, a form that would be so advanced that it would one day be able to contain the sun or the Christ. Whew, that's incredible. A human body that can actually contain the sun, the greatest solar spirit or the Christ, which is what Jesus did in his life. That is a powerful body. And the fact that we all have the potential to do that is mind blowing. Okay. It's incredible. I don't think that 
the mundane aspects of our life allow us to consider how incredible that is. How incredible it is to be human and yet how naturally supernatural it is at the same time. Okay. So the Venusians, um, these Venusian souls had somewhat of a development of, of mind and an eye, but not nearly the degree that we have now and that we are at. And that's precisely why this is a hard school, but it's also why um, there were those waves from Venus to begin with and why they ensouled. Okay, the, 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 these higher angelic beings, they ensouled into the human form. They didn't just hang around on like ships watching us like some, you know, United Nations in the sky. No, they ensouled into the human body because that was the whole point because the human body was going to develop this incredible eye. It was going to contain the sun and it was going to create this whole new incredible evolutionary arc in the spiritual hierarchies. That's how incredible you are. That is what is within you. That is your story. That is our story. Okay. Okay. All right. This one is about Lucifer. Okay. Why is Lucifer also referred to as the morning star or Venus and, and also Christ is? So um, the thing to remember about the interaction that the earth had with Venus and the angels from Venus, because that's exactly what Lucifer is. Lucifer is an angel that came from Venus in the very earliest cycle. So we don't call Lucifer an alien, right? It's very, <clears throat> it's very clear that Lucifer is a fallen angel, right? Now in Scientology and in the alien God myth, they're trying to make Lucifer and the beings from Venus or the beings from Mars, they're trying to make them a aliens or not. This is an angel. This is a being from the spiritual hierarchy, okay? So he was a very powerful angel and he gave humanity the gift of knowledge and a very early gift of mind and sort of the first impulse of understanding, you could say good and evil. That's, but once the Venusian angels and these streams of souls from Venus began coming in, right? They're subject to the same compression of darkness and karma and challenge and trauma that the human beings are. Once you pop, once you come into the, there's like something that went by. Oh, that was weird. I don't know if you guys saw that, but there was like a thing that went by. Um, once you come into the earthly plane from a higher plane, as I mentioned earlier, it takes a sacrifice. But then once you're in this plane, um, you're functioning in it like everyone else. You're, you're subject to the same forces, including the challenges. And the some of the first angels that did come from the Venusian plane, they did not pass the later initiations to do with the earth and the cosmos. So they came in and they were initially very initiating. But when it came to their own initiations, furthering themselves within the mission, they did not pass those initiations. So Lucifer was able to introduce knowledge and wisdom but he was not loving and that's what really held lucifer back is that he was not able to develop a loving spirit now other angels were able to do that there were other angelic beings that did not fall that went into an even higher level of initiation that use their earthly connections that use their earthly, not connections, that use their interaction with the earth and humanity. They did it so well that they actually reached an exalted level again. And then they became associated with Mercury. So you'll notice, especially in Rudolf Steiner's spiritual hierarchy lectures, he talks about a big influence of Venus in Lemuria. And then in Atlantis, it becomes all about the spirits of Mercury which are 
um, much more integrated and have the power of mind. And that's where you get Hermes and the Mercury traditions and things like that. Those forces are the angelic consciousnesses that graduated. The ones that fell are associated with Lucifer. So really it's Mercury that is the that was the initiating force. Okay. Um, so why people get mixed up in esoteric teachings is there isn't an understanding that the lineage of Venusians split. So yes, there were great initiating forces that came during the Lemurian epoch, right, as actual beings and offered themselves, especially the energy of mind, which is the light bearer, right? But of those beings, not all of them were able to further develop once they entered the plane. Some of them were not able to develop certain qualities. And those are the fallen angels. And there's stories and a whole bunch of stuff we can get into with that at another time. But there are fallen angels and there are risen angels, or there are certain consciousnesses that were able to evolve with the sun. They were able to develop certain qualities within their own being that was developing. And that catapulted them into yet an even higher stage. Right? So that's important to know. And, and the later stage of those angels is not associated with Venus anymore. It's associated with Mercury. And there's a very deep mystery in the solar system between Venus, Mars, and Mercury in the Earth and events that have happened and the creation of those spheres and all of that that has to do with what I'm talking about. Um, so Lucifer um, is associated with Venus, the morning star. Christ is also associated with Venus, the morning star. But Christ would also be associated with Mercury and the Melchizedek order and the secrets of Mercury as well. Um, so the beginning is Venus, right? The beginning is Venus. The beginning is the mother, of course. But there are evolutions on that that Lucifer did not achieve. Now, Lucifer can be redeemed from the abyss. And I also have a lecture on Lucifer and Armon, and I will link that below as well um, if you want to understand a little bit more about that. But I'm not going to go too long today, although I could just rattle on and on. Um, so check out the extra lectures that I have in the description. I'll try to link any lectures that seem to align. And um, don't forget as well that I think we must be like seven or eight lectures into this series. And I'll probably go in and number them, but there's a playlist on my YouTube channel that has all of these lectures in order. So you just have to go to the playlist. I'll put it below and it has all of the lectures in order so you can get them in the correct um, sequence. And as always, I am completely supported by you. So if you like my lectures, you want to keep them going, um, do consider becoming a member on my premium website. I usually do at least seven or eight hours of private content over there every single month. I take all, I, I take your questions every second Sunday and we just go on and on about every single topic you could imagine. A lot of the stuff I also go into detail there that I can't really go into on, on YouTube. Um, so please do consider supporting me there. It allows me to make these videos, to keep doing this and putting this free content out there. You can also make a donation via my website. That also helps me keep the lights on over here. So as always, all my love your way, and I will see you in our next chat. Mm -hmm.